So I will tell you about this uh, correct implementation, floating point implementation of the pointing polygon algorithm. And uh, in particular, in all the process that we developed to, to uh, end up with this, this correct implementation. And when I mean we, I refer to Laura Titolo, Marco Feliu, Cesar Munoz, and myself. So, but let me start by saying what is a point in polygon problem, in case you can uh, figure it out. But it's simply stated determining if a given point is inside or outside a polygon. And is, it has several applications, as you might imagine, ranging from computer games uh, through geographical information system, and more important for us in the National Institute for Space and NASA, about uh, traffic, air traffic management problems, such as uh, determining if uh, uh, an airspace, and sorry, an aircraft is uh, approaching an, uh, weather, a bad weather area, or if, for example, a drone is inside a mission area or, or keeping it outside of a restricted area. So there is a uh, well-known method, mathematical method, to solve this problem. One of them is ray casting, that is uh, based on counting how many times a ray is starting in the point of interest in S intersect the edges of P. And there is another uh, kind of solution that is based on uh, counting how many times the perimeter of, of P winds around the point of interest S. This last uh, modality, this last way of solving this problem is called the winding number, and is which will be the most uh, important for us. Uh, but there is something that um, you may be aware of by now that uh, straightforward implementations in floating point using floating point numbers or any kind of finite precision arithmetic may result in an incorrect um, result, in fact, due to the rounding error that are inherent to the use of floating point numbers. So our goal was uh, initially to develop this uh, formally verified floating point implementation of an efficient variant of the winding number method. So let me start by pointing out uh, this library of algorithms that is called Polycarp and uh, it has been de developed by NASA in the, last, in the last years. And it uh, has accumulated a, a lot of algorithms um, related with computation with polygons. And it has implementations in Java and C++ and Python, and several descriptions in using PBS, this uh, theorem prover for higher order logics. So in particular, Polycarp has uh, several variants of the winding number um, specified in PBS. And we have a proof of uh, equivalence between these uh, modalities, this different uh, description of the winding number algorithm. And I wanted to point out that a formal verification of the correctness of these uh, kind of, of, of algorithms, of these point in polygon algorithms, uh, from first principles is really a challenging problem uh, this uh, outside of the scope of this work. So let me tell you a little bit of the details of the, on the implementations of these, um, these kind of uh, algorithms uh, of the widening number. And the basic idea that you may find in the literature related to uh, the sum of the angles subtended by each edge with respect to the, to the point of interest and if the sum of all if these angles end up being zero, you can determine that the point is outside the polygon. This is a good solution, but it um, requires uh, the usage of trigonometric functions to determine the angles. So we will want to avoid this kind of, of function because of the inherent uh, rounded off uh, errors that they could introduce. So we try a better, maybe more simple idea that is related to counting uh, how the edges of the polygon changes in the, uh, from quadrant to quadrant. So let me explain the idea with this uh, basic example in the figure A. So if we start with the uh, top point of the polygon that is in the quadrant one, and we will walk through the perimeter of the, of the polygon in a counterclockwise direction, 
So we start with the edge that uh, goes from the quadrant one to the quadrant two. And since this, uh, the movement that we do from one to two is in a counterclockwise direction with respect to the point of interest, that in this case is in the center of coordinates, we will say that the, the contribution of this edge is a positive one. The next edge starts in quadrant two and goes to quadrant one. And since, and this, since this, uh, uh, this segment, this edge, in, uh, we move on over the edge in a clockwise direction with respect to the point of interest, we say that the contribution of this edge is a negative one. In the same sense, the next, in the same sense, the next uh, edge in starting one goes through four and ends in three. And since it, um, since the walk through the, um, over the perimeter um, is done in a clockwise way, we say that this uh, contribution is a negative two. Next edge will be, will uh, produce a contribution of positive two since it, we will be moving in a, a counterclockwise direction. The last edge, since it's, it starts and ends in the same quadrant, will add no contribution to the, to the final sum. So if we sum up all the contribution, we, then, we end up with a result of zero. So we say that the aircraft of the point of interest is outside the polygon. The other figure, the figure B, the point is inside the polygon, and so the sum is finally four. Sorry. So this is a um, pretty straightforward implementation of the previous idea. If you see, it has just three functions, and this uh, uh, functional setting. And the topmost function, the quadrant function, is a function that, given a point, tells you in which quadrant the point is located. The second function, edge contrib, is the one who computes the contribution of one particular edge with respect to the point. Here, the, the first two arguments of the function, bx and by, are the point of interest. And the next four represent the endpoints of the segment, ux, ui, sx, and, and sy. And if you look with a little more of, uh, of detail the, this um, function, you can, thank you. You can see that um, this uh, function also do the translation of the system so that the the, it moves the polygon and, or in this case, the edge and the point in a way that the point of interest end up in the center of coordinate as in the examples that I sh just showed you in the last slide. And finally, the winding number function just um, takes as parameter uh, two arrays, px and py, representing the uh, coordinates of the vertices of the polygon and the point in, of interest that in this case is represented by the argument sx and sy. And uh, this um, four is just um, syntactic sugar for a um, um, uh, to represent the um, uh, computation of each call to edge contrib and the accumulation of the results. And what I wanted to point out of this uh, simple description is that if you can see, it only has uh, elementary mathematical operations in it. Um, shows function calls, since winding number uses edge contrib and edge contrib uses quadrant. And, um, the iteration on winding number is not like a, is really a, sing, a simple, a very simple iteration. It's a bounded iteration, so it makes it, it keeps the, the thing very uh, easy to manipulate. And finally, we have uh, what we call mixed precision, since uh, if you see every of these three functions returns an integer number. Um, but anyway, the points in the, the arguments of the function are, in this case, real numbers and will be implemented as floating point numbers. So, for example, the problem that we can have, as you could imagine, if you uh, try to make a straightforward implementation of these, of these functions, in particular if you, if you can, the quadrant function, is that the evaluation of the guards of the ifs and else 
uh, can have uh, different uh, results in floating point and in real, in real evaluations and real value evaluations depending on the rounding, of, uh, the rounding error of the arguments. This kind of problems, we call the kind, this kind of anomaly, uh, is called usually test instability, and it occurs when a conditional statement uh, produces that the flow diverge from the real value evaluation versus the floating point uh, implementation, the floating point execution of the algorithm. So in particular, let me show you this example with this simple polygon and this point that is very close to the 2, 1.5, is in fact just a little bit to the right to 2, 1.5. And in this case, with these inputs, the real value evaluation of the widening number function will return zero, meaning that S is outside the polygon, but the floating point evaluation will return four, meaning that the point is inside the polygon. So, as you might, as, as you might think, this, um, the, the first idea that you may have is saying, okay, we have a problem when we are very close to the, to the segment, to the edges of the polygon. So why don't we just put a buffer on the edges and we make that our implementation respond or the point is inside or outside or is too close to the edge so I cannot decide what is happening. So the problem with that is even when you are very f really, well, 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 you are really outside of, of the polygon without any doubt, we can be in, this, in these areas that are uh, painted in red in the, in the figure that are over approximations of um, areas well, uh, where uh, in instability could occur. And we use um, a couple of tools to do this, uh, to compute these areas. And we found this point that is, as you can see, in the 4.1, a little above of the 0.41. And for this particular point and this particular edge, the V, V prime, the edge contrib function, the function that computes the contribution of a particular edge, will return minus one, stating that this edge span across adjacent quadrants, while the floating point evaluation of the same function will return zero, stating that these two uh, points, the end points of the edge, are in the same quadrant with respect to the, to the point of interest. Uh, so it's not enough to have a buffer on the edge because you may have problems really far away from the polygon. So in order to, to, to face this problem, we wanted to, uh, we came up with this technique, and the idea was starting with a real valued winding number description of the algorithm uh, that we have in PBS that we already know that uh, fulfill uh, some properties of interest for us, and we have proofs that say that. Uh, we wanted to have as an output a formally verifying floating point implementation in C. And this implementation will have uh, two kind of results. One result it could be a warning saying that there is, this is uh, not safe to decide about the, if the, poly, if the point is inside or not of the polygon, or a numerical, a numerical value. And in this case, we can assure that the result of the floating point algorithm is the same that you will have in the real value uh, um, evaluation. So we use uh, these tools, Precisa, FPROC, Pharmacy, and PBS, and let me show you how we use it. This is a, a basic idea of the workflow of the technique. As, as I mentioned, we started with the real value function in a PBS declaration. Maybe it was not the best uh, choice of colors, I'm sorry. So a little bit, it says a PBS declaration in the, I'm sorry, in the topmost um, uh, box. So we start with the real value function, then with this real value function we fed Precisa, that is this uh, static analyzer that we develop, and Precisa will 
end up with two main results. One of them is a bound for the round of error of the guards of the, pro of the initial problem, the initial program, sorry, and some proof certificates stating that these bound, these numerical bounds are correct, these uh, bounds for the round of errors. And this result is also a P stated as PBS lemmas and theories with the corresponding proof. And then we have, uh, as another result of Precisa, a uh, C code, a floating point implementation that doesn't have only the program, but also a notation in ACSL, that is this uh, language to uh, state pre and post conditions, stating this property that I just mentioned. Uh, I will uh, go into the details in the uh, next, next slides. Then we use, this is a C program, so Precisa and returns the PBS um, certificates for the round of errors and the C program, and the notated C program. Then we develop, uh, we modified the, the, WPU, the WP plugin from, from, for Framacy in such a way that Framacy could process the C program and state the verification conditions in PBS language. So we have the verification condition stated in PBS language, and we use the proof that Precisa already uh, uh, generated and the initial uh, declaration uh, specification of the, of the algorithm, and we use everything to prove that the verification conditions are valid, are true. So this, um, this generation of the C code um, is uh, based in this uh, problem transformation that we originally presented last year. And for this, this problem, we enhance the, the transformation in basically these ways. We added support for function calls, for mixed precision, and for simple bounded recursion, this the kind of for loop that I showed you before. And we added the ability uh, for Precisa to output C code, real C code. In, in fact, with the annotations that we wanted. And the general idea of the program transformation is simple to modify the if-then-else conditions in such a way that if you have uh, a condition such as in the example of E greater than zero, instead of that, you use uh, E greater than epsilon, where epsilon is the round of error of the expression E. And this round of error is computed by Precisa itself. And when um, you add the ability to the program, as I mentioned before, to return this uh, distinguished value that is warning and that we use omega to represent. And we return this when the instability may occur. So the transformation only relies in the existence of these two um, Boolean transformation functions, B plus and B minus. In the general idea is that when B plus of some uh, formula phi, I will use this tilde to mark that something is a floating point. In this case, phi tilde is a floating point formula, and the phi without tilde is the real counterpart of the same formula. And so the condition on, on the betas is that if beta plus of phi is valid in floating point, in, in a floating point evaluation, then also the original phi in floating point is valid, and the original phi in real value is valid. And the counterpart is the beta minus, when the beta minus of some formula phi is valid in floating point, then the negation of phi is valid in floating point, and the negation of phi is valid in real values. And then, well, this is a little ex um, explanation of how can you use this, how, how you can apply this idea to deal with more complex formulas, but it's the basic thing that you may imagine. So let me skip this quickly and we can come back later. And the idea is when you, have, you want to transform an if then else, you simply transform it in, uh, in this way. If you have if phi then a else b, then it will be transformed to if beta, beta plus of um, phi, then the transformation of a, else if beta minus of phi, then the transformation of B, and else this warning uh, value. So the idea is that you only get the transformation of A if you are sure that um, phi, uh, the floating point version of phi and the real value of phi is valid, and you already reach B 
if the negation of phi in floating point and real value are valid. And then let me, the, the rest of the thing, the function declaration, let me show you with an example. So here we have the uh, simplest function of the three that I showed you before, uh, the quadrant function, the top version is the same that, that we saw in a couple of slides before and is the real valued version. And below that, you have the transformation of the function. So the quadrant, the transformed version of the quadrant um, will accept as argument not only the point, the bx and by, but also these other parameters, ex and ey, that represent the round of error of the arguments. And then the if and else is translated in the, in the same way that I explained before. Um, so the important thing is that um, this theorem uh, states the correctness as we want it, okay. And the thing is, um, the important thing is that the, is a transformated version of quadrant is, will not return a warning, then the, the value returned for the transformed version of quadrant will be the same as the real value for the corresponding inputs. So, um, in practical terms, this theorem is added in the, in the C floating point implementation generated by Precisa in the ACSL uh, post condition of the function. So, this theorem is there, and then uh, Framacy will export will output and verification condition stating, is stating this uh, theorem. And edge contrib is pretty similar. So let me skip the widening number. It's the same with a little bit of details for handling the, the for loop. And we have also the same kind of correctness, um, uh, the correctness theorem for the widening number. That the important thing that I wanted you to remember is in the bottom of the slide saying the same that I just painted before. So, um, the idea, as, as I mentioned before as well, is that uh, Precisa will generate these three uh, transformed function in C, in, in a floating point implementation, with the annotations for every theorem, correctness theorem, as we want it. And then we use uh, from a C to export these verification conditions always uh, uh, again in PBS language, and we can we can have we can close this, the this, the cycle the verification cycle, proving these properties in these verification conditions in PBS. <clears throat> so we uh, performed an analysis of the testability of this winding number algorithm. And we reach an automatic generation of the floating point on a floating point implementation. And then, um, well, Precisa um, has been improved. We improved Precisa to automatically generate this code with the annotations. And we modified a plugin for Framacy in, in such a way that we could get the verification conditions again in PBS language. And all the verification conditions. Uh, were proved in PBS. We proven them in PBS. And as a bonus, we developed this tool with, with which we draw this uh, last figure with the, with the bands in red. And so since I'm um, a I'm little out of, of time, I will let you to ask me these questions later. So thank you. So my name is Heiko. I'm a PhD student at MPI SWS in Germany. And um, so today I want to tell you about how we extended our pipeline to verify round of errors with two separate extensions. But before I speak about all these kind of extensions, I want to tell you what these round of errors actually are. Oh, that was the wrong direction, sorry. That way. 
So as you all know, finite precision numbers are commonly used to approximate real numbers in computers. And due to this approximation, computations with finite precision arithmetic are slightly off from the value you would expect on real numbers. So as an example on this slide, 0 0.2 plus 0 0.1, as you all know, in real numbers gives you 0 0.3. But the floating point result, which I'll denote by tildes, so following the notation from the previous talk, that's slightly off, right? And that is usually called the round off error of the computation, which makes it a bit off. And now the question that you might ask here, does this actually matter? And for that, this picture shows the German state parliament of Schleswig-Holstein. Why am I showing you that? So we're speaking about the state parliament elections of the year 1992. And it was the night of the election, they were counting, and in Germany we have this special rule that every party to be seated in a parliament needs 5% of the votes at least to get one seat. And now the Green Party was running at 4.97%. And you can see what's going to happen, right? Rounded, they got 5%. So that means floating point round of errors just changed the parliament makeup. And just imagine this happening on a safety critical system where you have a marginal decision and you just run into the wrong case accidentally. So rounding errors can have some impact. And they actually become more complicated once you start looking at functions. So the formula here is relatively tricky, and so the epsilon on the right-hand side, sorry, that was too fast, the epsilon on the right-hand side here, that is the round of error that you want to bound for all possible inputs that you may give to the function. And because this formula is tricky, we want this to be estimated, automated, precise, and correct. For that, we had our tool that we had last year at FMCAD, which extended the daisy static analyzer that takes as input a real valued function and some constraints on the inputs, and by a data flow analysis synthesizes a finite precision implementation of the real valued specification and gives you an upper bound on the round of error between the two. And what we did in our paper there is we extended daisy to encode its results in a certificate and these certificates are given to our verifier, which we call Flover, which is implemented in a Koch theorem prover. And if that verifier succeeds, we get a proof that the error bound in the certificate is valid. So this looks like all done, right? But there's something that I'm hiding. So our pipeline from FMCAD supports two different analyses. One is interval arithmetic, which just abbreviates things, which is plain intervals, right, axes, and AB, and a fine arithmetic, which approximates values with affine polynomials. And the thing is, there was this jet engine benchmark, and if you give that one to Daisy, with having our flower pipeline and so and so forth, and you use interval arithmetic, sorry, that way, and you use interval arithmetic, Daisy will say, oh, there is a spurious division by zero that, uh, so, sorry, not, Daisy has a spurious error that it finds which says there's a potential division by zero in that program. And so we cannot actually get a certificate and cannot infer a round of error here. But it turns out if we disable our certificate generation and we use an SMT-based analysis in Daisy, we can actually find a round of error. And that is due to Daisy having more analyses that we did not yet certify in Flover because they are more complicated than the simple ones we opted for. So our goal was to add these analyses to Flover to prove some more interesting error bounds and make Flover more precise. So the contributions in our paper is that we give two, sorry, the contribution in our paper is that we give two implementations, one for an SMT-based range analyses, and the other one for an analysis using interval subdivisions. If this is not directly clear to you what this means, I'll use the rest of the talk to explain to you what these two analyses are and how we certify them. But before that, I want to briefly mention how DAISY actually upper bounds round of error. Just coming back to the picture from before, right, DAISY synthesizes this finite precision implementation and a round of error. And we want to bound, we want, we want this epsilon to upper bound this inequality. 
And now the thing is, because we deal with arbitrary inputs here, if the values become infinitely big, the round of error actually becomes infinitely big too, so that means that we have to take into account the ranges. So the first step in DAISY is that we compute an over-approximation of the real-valued range of each and every sub-expression of this input function that we get. And using these ranges, we then estimate or compute an upper bound to the round of error. And just following this exact picture of splitting the analyses into two parts, we have set up Flover similarly to have our two, two separate components where the top one, real range valid, is used to certify the real valued range bounds that DAISY has inferred, and error valid is used to certify the round of error bounds that DAISY has computed. And now, Coming back to the actual topic of the talk, we want to implement these two analyses. And given that we have this nice modular, uh, modular setup in Flover, the first extension that we're going to do is we extend the real valued range validator with an SMT based analysis that certifies results from the SMT solver. But before I speak about that, I'll again quickly explain to you how the analysis works in DAISY, because that gives you an idea how it is certified. So our goal in DAISY, which was already implemented before, is now to find a lower and an upper bound L and H, such that for every value in the inputs constraints that we get, the function value is contained in this interval. And we want to do this using an SMT solver, but the first step we do is we compute L and H just with plain interval arithmetic. The next step then is to do kind of a two iterations separately, one for the lower bound and one for the upper bound. The upper bound works analogous, so I'll only explain the lower bound here. And what we do is we pick a new lower bound that we want to use as the new sound lower bound for our analyses, and we encode this in a query to the SMT solver, which asks the SMT solver, is there a counter example such that my new lower bound becomes unsound because you choose a value that is within the input constraints but makes the function return a value which is smaller than the new lower bound. We give this query to the Z3 SMT solver and if it reports SAT, we of course have to keep the old lower bound because the new one is unsound. If it reports unsat, we replace the lower bound with the newly found and now justified new lower bound and rinse and repeat this algorithm until we get a SAT answer. So far, so good. This was the analysis in DAISY. If we now want to certify this analysis in, a, in our certificates, the first step that we do is we record only the last query that was unsatisfiable in our certificate such that Flover has access to this query that was sent to the SMT solver. Then, in Flava, we check the format of the query, so whether it matches the syntactic structure of the function and the input, cons input constraints. And our assumption here is that the query was unsatisfiable, so we do not validate the result of the SMT solver, we only check the syntactic encoding. From this query that we now validated syntactically, we extract the L new, which is the new bound that we think DAISY has found, and compare it to the one that DAISY has written down in the certificate as the range bound. And if this check succeeds, this validates the bound that was encoded in the certificate. So this concludes the range estimation using SMT solvers. So we have that part. And now, following the modular structure from before, the next step is to implement the interval subdivisions, but because they are not part of a real range analysis or a round of error estimation, we add them as a separate component. So coming back again to the big picture in DAISY, if you ran DAISY without interval subdivisions, that means for a function with two inputs, so X and Y here, DAISY will just analyze the full range of both variables in a single run. But the, our goal is to make the analysis more precise, and what we do there is we split these input ranges 
in this example in three sub-intervals, and now analyze the Cartesian product of all of these splits that we get. And the global range is now the union of all the ranges that we found in these Cartesian uh, elements of the Cartesian product, and the global error bound is just a maximum from all of the subdivisions. So this was for DAISY. Now again, how it works in Flover. Our goal now is to certify that the global result that DAISY found is sound. And for that, similar to the SMT analysis, we record each and every subdivision that was done in DAISY in our certificate. Now we run our Flover checking pipeline on each of the elements in the interval subdivisions that were encoded. So we get this nice green check marks on each and every element. And the next and final step is we check that DAISY didn't forget to do a subdivision analysis on one element because it could be that that one is actually the one which contributes the maximum round of error. So this concludes the two separate extensions that we did. And our soundness theorem for Flover, of course, changes now also. So the soundness theorem now says, if we're given a certificate with F, P, and epsilon, which are the values we already had before, and Q, which are now the queries that we send to the SMT solver, assuming that these queries are unsatisfiable and Flover succeeds to validate the certificate, this proves that the round of error which is encoded in the certificate is valid. So we have our soundness result, but of course the more interesting question to ask is how precise are the bounds now that we can certify with these extensions to Flover, because remember our goal was to actually make the analysis more precise. And before I'll mention our experiments, I want to quickly comment on the related work, because given that there is so many tools in this area, it's important to compare. So Daisy and Flover are on the left-hand side of this table, then the closest tool, because it uses a similar analysis approach and uses a similar certification approach, is GAPA. Then the next one, which we already heard in the previous talk, is Precisa. In contrast to Flover and GAPA, their analysis is based on a global optimization-based method, so they don't use a static analysis. Similarly, FP Taylor, sorry, they don't use a data flow analysis. It's based on a static analysis. <laughs> so then a similar tool is FP Taylor. And Precisa and FP Taylor use different provers to certify their bounds, but that's just for completeness here. So Daisy and Flover and Gappa are for now the only tools to support fixed point arithmetic, but therefore Precisa is the only tool which is able to handle conditionals, and as we've seen before, also to mingle with them such that they can be nicely implemented, and supports loops, which is beyond the scope of Daisy and Flover. What I'm kind of glimpsing over here is that FP Taylor is the tool which computes one of the most accurate bounds for our setting, so we chose to compare with FP Taylor in our experimental evaluation. So what we did in our experimental evaluation in the first step is we ran all our separate analysis methods that we now supported in Flover and Daisy and compared the round of errors. So the ones on the left-hand side, interval and affine arithmetic, are the ones that were there before in our FMCAT paper. And then, to, more to the right, the SMT-based analyses uses SMT-based range estimations, and interval subdivisions just exercises the plain subdivisions without using any special analyses, whereas SMT and subdivisions is our kind of strongest supported analyses because it uses the SMT solver to estimate the ranges in each and every subdivision that we do. And I'm just giving you a brief excerpt of the round of errors that we can certify here, the full table we have in our paper. And for round of errors, kind of the, the intuition is the smaller the number, the better, because the closer your floating point computation is to what you expect it to do. And then, as I mentioned before, we benchmark against FP Taylor. And so I'm highlighting the most accurate bound for each benchmark with green and bold font. And as you see, FP Taylor still beats us on nearly all benchmarks, but on the Fluidus one, we're a little better. But notice that 
even though F.P. Taylor's numbers are still more accurate, we're in the same order of magnitude. So there's like a very marginal difference now. To conclude, with our extension, Flover and Daisy are now on par, which makes Flover able to certify bounds for a state-of-the-art tool. We have our fully sound pipeline, which allows it to certify these interesting bounds. And with that, I would like to conclude, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Good morning, everyone. My name is Julien Brunel. This talk is about uh, the verification of a distributed protocol named CORD. <clears throat> so um, CORD is a peer-to-peer -peer lookup protocol, meaning that uh, it aims to locate uh, data in a peer-to-peer -peer network. Right, and as uh, the authors uh, say in the original uh, CORD article, it is designed to be efficient, to be robust, and more particularly, to be simple and easily provable. And so, and this part um, interested us uh, in particular, the, the easily provable uh, part, which is, as you will see, not, uh, not so obvious in the end. <clears throat> At least less easy than the authors originally thought. Okay, so let's see um, the structure of a cord uh, network. Um, um, so each node has a unique identifier. Um, it also has a pointer to its successor in the network, uh, so with which it will communicate to locate data. And um, for um, technical maintenance purpose, it also uh, has a pointer to its predecessor in the network. Um, and here we will focus on the maintenance part of, this, of the protocol. Um, which aims to maintain the structure of the network so that um, every data located in every node can be or is accessible from any node of the, in the network. Um, okay, so such a, a state where every node can access every node is called an ideal state. Here in the picture, the arrow denotes the successor relation. Okay, and as you see, in an ideal state, the successor relation forms a ring. Um, and for uh, efficiency reasons, um, the successor relation also has to comply in some sense with the identifier order. Okay, so let's say a few words about this identifier order. So you can think of identifiers as uh, natural numbers with usual order on, or over natural numbers. But uh, since in the ideal state there has to be some kind of match between the ring structure of the network and uh, the um, identifier order, well, this identifier order has to be somehow uh, to have a, um, a, a ring shape also. Uh, so um, if you consider the identifier ordered from the least identifier to the uh, greatest identifier, well, the next identifier of the, of the, uh, um, yeah, sorry, of the greatest identifier, the, the, the next identifier of this one is the minimum, is the least identifier, so that we have this uh, ring, so we no longer have uh, an order, actually, even if I may say in the rest of the talk, uh, identifier order, it's not really an order, it doesn't make sense to compare two identifiers because they are both less than and greater than each other, right? But, however, what makes sense now is to consider this ternary relation saying that one identifier is located between uh, two identifiers. So, for example, two is located between one and three. It's also located between one and zero because of the loop. 
but it's not located between three and, and uh, five, for instance. Okay. Okay. So let's go back to um, the core structure. Uh, so the, the goal of the maintenance protocol is to maintain this ideal state, with, which have uh, which has a, a ring uh, structure. Uh, but it's not possible to uh, ensure it at any time uh, <coughs> because when nodes join the network, they create what we call appendages, okay, which breaks uh, this ring structure. Uh, besides, because we want to be robust to failures, um, each node has not only one successor but actually a list of successors so that if the first successor fails, leaves the network, well, hopefully the second successor is still part of the network uh, and uh, the, the node is still connected to the rest of the, of the network. So there is a, a, an important assumption in, uh, in code which saying that each node has, a, has at least one live successor among, the, among its list of successors. Okay. Uh, so here we, we see, for example, uh, 54 and 57 that has, has just joined the network and that are parts of uh, appendages. They are not yet in the ring. Okay. okay, so now we can define in a more precise way what the ideal state is. Um, so uh, first, the, the successor relation, as we said, uh, forms a ring and every node is in the ring, right? Second, um, this relation, the successor relation, has to comply with the um, identifier order, okay? We want to forbid this kind of situation where, um, if, where some nodes are skipped, okay? So for example, uh, 38 here, well, its successor skips over 49 and 62 and uh, points to uh, 65. We want to forbid this in, in an ideal state for, uh, well, for, for, so that the um, uh, localization is uh, more e efficient, okay? And the last two um, properties of the ideal state say that the predecessor relation is the converse of the successor. The predecessor here is this is denoted by a dotted arrow, um, and the, well, the full list of successors has to be valid. Okay. Uh, so now we can state the correctness property, what we expect uh, from the maintenance protocol of CORD. So uh, what we want is that if we start from, a net, from an ideal state, and if at some point there is no more join or fail, then eventually we uh, reach um, an ideal state and remain ideal. Okay, so I, I couldn't resist to write it in temporal logic, LTL, uh, although we don't use uh, temporal logic at all in, 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 this, uh, in this paper. But well, for people familiar with temporal logic, it may help to understand uh, well, the, the property. We simply say that if eventually um, there are no more join or fail, then eventually we reach the ideal state and remain ideal. Okay, <coughs> okay so now we've seen the property that we expect from the maintenance operations. Let's uh, look at the maintenance operations. Um, so the first step of the maintenance called stabilization is, execu is executed uh, in any node periodically. So when a node N stabilizes, well, it simply asks its successor, what is your predecessor? Then when it receives the identifier of the predecessor, it simply compares according to the identifier order. Um, this obtained identifier with itself and with its successor. And depending on the result of the comparison, we have two possible options. Option A, the node sends a message to its successor, well, take me as your predecessor in a forthcoming action because I'm a better candidate, candidate to be your predecessor than your current one. Or option B, um, the node N simply updates its successor pointer 
uh, to the predecessor of its successor. So le let's look at this in a quite, uh, well, in, a, in an example. So here we have this configuration where every node is in the ring except for that has just joined the, the network and is in, a, in an appendage. Uh, so suppose that four stabilizes. Then it asks six, its successor, what is your predecessor? Six answers, it's one. And what four does is that it checks whether itself is located between one and six in the identifier order. If it, well, in this, uh, in this situation, the answer is yes, so um, uh, four sends a message to uh, its successor, take me as your predecessor in a forthcoming action, step two A. Okay, this is what happens in step two. We call this uh, step rectification. So node six rectifies, meaning that uh, it takes four as its predecessor. So now we are in this situation where four is not yet in the ring. Uh, so there are still uh, some maintenance to, to do. Uh, now suppose that one uh, stabilizes. Uh, so you know how it works now. It asks its successor six, what is your predecessor? Six answers four and one checks whether itself um, is uh, located between four and six. In this case, the answer is no. So we are in step in, in the option B, in the case B, um, where um, one uh, needs to end the stabilization. Okay, let's call this step uh, end of stabilization. And uh, one uh, takes four as its uh, new successor. So now four is really part of the ring and we are back to uh, the ideal state, okay? Uh, so that's it for the uh, maintenance operations. So indeed, they are quite uh, simple, only three uh, steps, uh, right? I just omitted cases where um, some successor or some predecessor does not answer because he left the, the network, he failed, okay? But the main ideas are really there, only three main operations, um, and they are supposed to be sufficient to ensure the, the, the correctness property that, we, that we've seen in the beginning of the talk. So let's see how we can validate uh, this, uh, this protocol, this maintenance protocol. Um, as I said in the introduction, the authors originally claimed that, well, the correctness is easily provable. They even, in, the, um, in, in a second paper, exhibited some invariants to help proving the correctness. And actually, most of them turned out to be, to be wrong. An example of a, a property claimed invariant by, by the author is um, the one saying that if you have a ring and an appendage, well, the appendage is supposed to join the ring at the correct position, not before, not after, just at the correct node. Um, this is true in the nominal situation, but it's possible actually to exhibit some scenario that violates uh, this property. And Pamela Zaev um, did a, a huge work um, analyzing uh, code, um, and uh, she, she modeled the version of, of cord in, uh, in alloy, using alloy, and she uh, had um, many counter examples uh, for, uh, for, for, for the invariance uh, claimed by the uh, authors of cord. Um, in, uh, in another paper uh, in, two, in 2017, uh, she even proposed a clever invariant for cord and used this invariant to prove uh, well, uh, she gave a high-level proof um, to prove the correctness of cord. So what we did from, from after uh, Pamela Zaev did this, uh, wrote this paper, is that we um, uh, uh, took Pamela's, Pamela's model, um, we adapted it uh, to our own model checker, which extends alloy with temporal features, called Electrum. If you want to know more, 
um, you're most welcome to the uh, next uh, Friday to the tutorial uh, about Electrum, by the way. So in, in the paper that we presented last uh, year at FMCAD, we uh, used Electrum to model check the correctness of chords. Uh, and as expected, when you uh, mechanically verify some proof that, were, uh, that was done by hand, we found some corner cases and modeling, modeling issues in, uh, in the work uh, of Pamela Zaves. But we, so in the, we ended up with a, um, a variant of code uh, that we checked correct, but uh, we, with this model checker, but only for uh, bounded uh, size, for networks of bounded size, and uh, even for very small size, actually. Uh, so, uh, the natural follow-up uh, is to have a proper proof uh, that stands for a network of an arbitrary size, right? And this is precisely what we do in the paper uh, I'm presenting today. Um, so to do so, we form formalize code. Uh, we use the um, even B language and with the Rodin platform. Um, and we used, well, some standard proof technique based on invariant and variant. Uh, the variant, the inductive invariant that we have is uh, uh, inspired by uh, the one that Pamela Zave uh, exhibited. And, and for the variant, we applied some proof obligations uh, pattern to establish this particular kind of liveness property uh, that we, that we saw with the correctness property, which is a stabilization property, actually. Yeah. Okay, um, so let's see uh, the formalization of, of code. So nothing um, surprising here. Uh, we have a set of nodes. We have a set of members among them. So the non-members the non are the nodes like 61 and 31 in the picture that, are, uh, that left the network. Uh, we have a function, SOOC, for uh, the, denoting the, well, the successor relation for each node, the list, giving the list of successor. Um, PRDC, the function PRDC for the uh, predecessor of, uh, of a node. And we also need um, some extra uh, relations for, um, remember that between step one and step two, we either needed to send some message, so we need a mailbox for, for that, it's the relation rectifying, or we need to um, remember that we need to end the stabilization. So we need a, a register for this. This is a stab stabilizing uh, function. Um, okay, so that's it for the formalization of the structure of the network. Uh, we also modeled, of course, the, well, the, as, as even be, events, uh, the um, steps, okay, the, the maintenance operations. Uh, and yeah, and, and le let's, uh, so the, all this is uh, described in the paper. Um, and a, an interesting property of a cord network, again uh, exhibited by Pamela Zave, uh, is the notion of a principal node. So a principal node is a node that is not skipped by any other node in the network. In other words, any node that is supposed to be aware of the presence of this node is indeed aware. So it, it doesn't skip with, with a successor over, over the, this node if, if the node is a principal. And here we consider a simple property, some principle saying that there is in the network somewhere one, at least one principal node. And this uh, simple property has interesting um, consequences. One of them is that if there is some principal node in the network, then there is at most one ring um, in the network. So there, there, there may be appendages to the ring, but there cannot be another uh, disconnected ring uh, in, uh, in that network. Okay, no, another interesting property is that if there is someone, uh, somewhere um, some principal node, then every node, for every node, the successor list is ordered up to a certain point. The first live node, even a little more, but let's keep it uh, uh, this way. Okay, so our inductive invariant is like this. Um, 
well, there is some principal node, and um, every node has um, at least one live successor among its list of successors, uh, which is defined here. Uh, well, there is a, a technical uh, conjunct which is missing here, but it's in the, in the paper. Of course, it, could, it would be um, quite easy to break this invariant if um, um, all the principal nodes fail at the same time, for instance, without any maintenance operation uh, between, um, between the different failures. Or if all the successors of a node fail at the same time. Okay, so there is the operating assumption that no failure breaks this invariant. Okay, the, the, and actually the only way to break this invariant is to have failures occurring much faster than the maintenance operations. Okay. Um, well, so now we have the invariant. Uh, let's uh, look at the proof of the liveness property. And the, the way we, we did it, okay, is that we um, uh, defined different properties that are stronger and stronger, that we call meta state, such that if we start from a state satisfying the invariant, the inductive invariant, then we are ensured to reach at some point a state satisfying meta state one. And from a state satisfying meta state one, we are sure to reach at some point meta state two, and so on until we reach the ideal state. Okay? So again, the details are in the paper. Um, I, I just give a well, brief overview of these meta states. The first three meta states, um, they simply say that uh, we need to clean up the dead nodes, the node that left the network, from um, the successor point, the first successor pointer, the predecessor, um, the rectifying uh, mailbox, the stabilizing register. So we need to first to execute the maintenance operations that are in charge of cleaning the dead nodes, right? And the fourth meta state is probably the most important in terms of, of, the, of the proof. Um, says in particular that the first successor, uh, well, the, the, the predecessor relation is the converse of the first successor, which implies that since predecessor is functional, which implies that the successor, uh, the first successor relation is injective. So if, if it's injective, so there, there cannot be any um, appendages, okay? So there is only one ring. And uh, thanks to the property saying that there is some um, principal node, it's quite easy to prove that um, the um, successor relation respects the, the order on, uh, on identifiers. So we are almost in the ideal state. We just miss one step concerning the rest of the list of successors, okay? And then, we have to prove that uh, this last meta state implies uh, the ideal state. Okay, so just, <clears throat> just uh, uh, one slide about how we uh, manage to prove each step. So to prove that from m one meta state, we are ensured to reach the next meta state at some point, we used these, uh, these proof obligations. The first two were generated by uh, Rodin, of, uh, yeah, fortunately, and uh, the last two uh, well, had to be added manually uh, as uh, theorems to, to be proved. Uh, so we had to be careful in particular for uh, not to forget anything in this big uh, disjunction saying that at least one of the um, of the event that make the variant decrease uh, is, uh, is enabled. Okay, and then um, I can conclude. So um, we, <clears throat> well, this is to our knowledge the first mechanized proof of this um, uh, distributed protocol of code. Um, as expected, the main difficulties lied in uh, well, uh, finding the good invariant and finding the, the, the variance uh, and, and the metastates. Uh, 
Um, here, most proofs hopefully were automatic thanks to SMT solvers that were called by Rudin, right? Um, and uh, uh, well, as future work, we well, here uh, when we worked uh, on the on the proof, we would have appreciated a lot uh, to have more support uh, to prove stabilization properties. Um, we well, it would be great also to be able to model more um, concrete data types like FIFO to to uh, model the communications between between nodes in the distributed system. And well, these are just two examples of a more general uh, goal, which is to have some uh, framework for validating distributed system with the uh, most possible support and the highest possible degree of uh, automation. That's it. Thank you for your attention. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is uh, about uh, a formal theory uh, of symbolic execution. I'm Frank de Boer, and my partner in crime is Marcelo Bonzano, seated over, over there. So let me... Uh, I think you need to stay close to the, ah. the microphone. Okay, so I... <laughs> That's a bit too much. Yeah, I would like to move around a little bit. But, uh, is this better? Okay, thank you. Uh, so, what is uh, first uh, a few words about uh, what symbolic execution is, is about? So, in testing, the, the, the idea is the rough idea is that uh, given a, a program, a system, you provide some input, you run the program, and then test whether the output satisfies some, uh, some constraints, some specifications. But of course, you can try many more uh, inputs, but for example, what would be possible that you try all the, all the time with these different inputs the same path. So you would also like to ensure some coverage. And here comes in uh, symbolic execution. The rough idea of symbolic execution is to generate a Boolean condition from the program symbolically, yeah, which, which defines actually the, the execution path. So it's a constraint on the input, which ensures that a given path will be uh, executed. And so this is important for providing some coverage in, in testing. No, I have yet another problem. Uh, yeah, a motivation about uh, this work. So uh, symbolic execution is well known. There are many tools uh, around. But Marcello and I, we uh, are giving a course, a master course at the Leiden University, and there we found out, uh, yeah, there's rather a lack of a general uh, formal theory. And this is also reflected in the, in the tool uh, support. There's hardly any formal specification of both correctness and completeness, and many of the tools dive immediately into implementation issues concerning object-oriented programming features like dynamically allocated variables. So what we would like to do is to come up with a formal theory which specifies, for example, for a very basic language uh, what symbolic execution is about and which allows an incremental extension to more complicated programming constructs. So this formal theory, yeah, how to go about developing a formal theory of symbolic execution. So we use the, the formal method of transition systems I hope you are familiar with that. And the basic idea, which is really not rocket science, is to specify symbolic execution by a symbolic transition system. And then you have a concrete transition system which models the actual execution. And then correctness and completeness can be defined in terms of a relation between these two transition systems, like in terms of a simulation relation. So that's overall the very general uh, idea. Now I'm going to explain how this uh, 
how to uh, work this out, how to instantiate this uh, uh, very general idea in terms of a, a symbolic execution, a theory of symbolic execution for basic uh, language. A very basic language, so these are the programming uh, expressions. We have variables and we have some built-in operations on these uh, uh, expressions. And we assume just very simple variables uh, of, of basic types like uh, integer and, bo and boolean. Now, the, the main uh, mechanism for generating a path condition is based on, on, on a substitution. That's one of the core ideas in symbolic execution. And uh, yeah, what is a, sim a substitution? It just assigns to each program variable an, uh, an expression. And then we have the usual notion of substitution. Uh, I'm not going into the details, but because that's uh, very uh, standard. And then you can define a symbolic configuration as a triple consisting of a statement to be executed, a substitution, and a so far constructed path condition. So given this and a simple uh, while language, I assume just basic assignments and if then else, uh, sequential composition and so on, then you can define uh, symbolic transitions. For example, here you see the transition specifying the semantics of an assignment. So you execute an assignment in a, in a sequential context and you just update the substitution by assigning to the variable x the expression e the right-hand side expression of the assignment under the substitution. That's the very basic uh, thing. And then choice, yeah, you just non-deterministically go to the then branch or the else branch and you just update your path condition correspondingly by adding the Boolean or the negation of the Boolean condition under the substitution. And similarly for the while uh, statement. So this is all very uh, straightforward to come up with such a symbolic transition system for a basic language. So how can we now define uh, the correctness of um, the symbolic transition system? Now, given a concrete transition system which uh, specifies the semantics in terms of a concrete valuation which assigns values, actual values, booleans, integers, to your variables, I'm not going to uh, specify uh, the, the details of the, this concrete transition system, but that's fairly uh, straightforward. And then you can come up with the following uh, correctness uh, uh, theorem, that if I have a reachable symbolic configuration, <coughs> this guy here, from an initial one, and the initial one starts from the uh, identity substitution. Furthermore, if you have a valuation fee which makes the path condition true, now, then you know that this V actually is an input state so that you can reach uh, this particular concrete state which is obtained as uh, a kind of composition between the valuation and the substitution. So V, valuation V followed by sigma means like uh, I take the expression which is assigned to the variable x under the substitution, and I take the value of that expression. This, this works also in this context because the language is deterministic, and therefore it's ensured that the symbolic path is actually executed in this initial valuation field. Yep. Now, for completeness, you would also like to, to uh, uh, have some coverage <coughs> notions of the other way around, that uh, you, you don't miss computation, so to speak, at the symbolic uh, level. This can be defined in terms of a simulation relation between concrete uh, configurations and symbolic uh, ones. Um, so it's defined as follows. Uh, so these two configurations are in this simulation relation. If there exists an initial valuation, V0, such that V can be uh, seen as a composition of V0 and this uh, substitution, which you have constructed so far, so far and V0 makes this uh, path condition uh, true. And then you can prove uh, the following simulation relation that if two such configurations, a concrete one and a symbolic one, are in this relation and the concrete one can do a step, then the symbolic one can also do a step and the resulting configuration are again in this uh, uh, relation. 
So in, the, in this sense, now we have established a formal theory of symbolic uh, execution and defined uh, correctness and uh, completeness. Okay, but uh, this is very basic. And we would like now to uh, show you how we can extend this in a relatively smooth way to more advanced programming constructs. Like, for example, the constructs provided by object orientation. And one of the main uh, issues there in symbolic execution is how to deal with so-called dynamically allocated variables. In this basic language, you just had a finite set of variables. No? But in, uh, in object orientation, you can create new object instan instances, and therefore you, uh, uh, yeah, this generate the so-called uh, dynamically allocated variables. So let's see how we can deal with this in a, in a rather smooth way uh, by extending this basic theory. So what kind of variables do we have in uh, object orientation? We have global variables in this setup, which occur in the main statement. We have local variables, which occur as formal parameters of the methods. And we have instance variables, which occur in class definition. I hope this is more or less uh, all uh, standard. And then the programming uh, expressions are more or less defined in a similar way. But now uh, the variables are more complicated. You have three kinds of different uh, variables. And we have operations on these expressions. There's a mute little detail that uh, for this uh, extension, we actually assume that the only operations on object ideas are uh, basically dereferencing and testing. Uh, to add more uh, operations, like if you would add abstract data structures like list and so on, that would rather complicate uh, matters, but it, it, uh, it can be done. You can, uh, Trust me, but this is a, a, a rather simple setting where the only operation on object identities is that of, of uh, testing. But of course, I mean, any kind of abstract data structures in the end you could actually implement in, a, in an object-oriented language. So you could actually pre-process them uh, away, so to speak. So, yeah, the main point now <laughs> is uh, how do you define this substitution? Eh? Before, the, the substitution was just... Uh, assigning expressions, symbolic expressions. Uh, yeah, but an expression by nature is, is symbolic, I would say. So as we had only a finite set of variables assigning, uh, and you assign expressions to them. So the question now is, what are your variables now? Now, we define them as uh, so-called heap variables, and you can see them as so-called uh, navigation variables. You start with global variables, and with the useful dot notation, you can dereference them. But actually, for the symbolic execution engine, these are just names. Actually, uh, the dot doesn't mean anything. It's just a way of constructing a name. Uh, expressions are then, uh, the basic expressions are such heap variables, and uh, uh, you can apply some built-in operation on expressions. Th so that's a symbolic heap, uh, which assigns uh, expressions to these uh, heap variables. We have a local environment, so there's another complication. Previously, we didn't have recursion, so we add now recursion because you have method calls and so on. I'm not going to describe that in detail, but for, to model a recursion, you have to model a stack with, with so-called closures, which will find a local environment and a statement to be executed, uh, etc. Yeah, but uh, this is an important thing now: the notion of an, uh, sub, uh, apl applying a substitution. So in the, in the symbolic engine, you will, in general, when you model a, an assignment to an instance variable, you, uh, for example, you will apply a substitution. And a substitution now is a union of the local environment and the, and, and the heap uh, substitution. Eh? Because you have two substitutions, the global one and, 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 and the local one. And then we have this definition, so a global variable. Now, yeah, you just look up. In the, in, the, in, the, in the heap for a local variable, you look up uh, for in, in, the, in the local environment. And then we have for an instance variable. So what you do, you, you look up for the expression assigned to this. So this is a, uh, an implicit formal parameter of any method. So you look up uh, in the local environment for the expression assigned to, to this. And then you take uh, the expression, let's say, Sigma of this is the heap variable h, and then you look up the expression of h dot x as provided by sigma. Yeah, that's a, a little different from 
a little bit more complicated than the standard substitution uh, application. Okay, then we come to a symbolic update. Uh, that of global variables is, uh, is straightforward. Uh, I'm not going to uh, try to explain that too much, but uh, if you update, so what I want to do, I want to describe the update of a heap uh, which describes that I assign the expression E to the heap variable h.x. Now, now I have to take into account possible aliases. And that's what is dealt with by generating this conditional expression. So this is an expression. Huh? Yeah. It's a conditional expression, and I basically just check whether the expressions assigned to h prime and h are the same, whether intuitively they, they refer to the same, uh, say, symbolic location, and then the value should be, uh, then the actual value is described by E, and otherwise I pass sigma, I apply sigma to h dot x. Okay, you, know, you have to think a little bit about this, but the, the message is that uh, updates of, uh, of the heap you can describe by introducing a conditional, a conditional expression for dealing with the uh, alias. Oh, and then uh, there you go, uh, you can then uh, des describe the, uh, the symbolic transition system. So here is an uh, update of a global variable. So when you are at the global variable, you are, say, on ground zero, uh, you are executing the main statement. The main statement does not have a local environment, which is indicated by bottom. And you just uh, assign, uh, you update the, the, the heap sigma by assigning uh, the expression E under the substitution sigma to, uh, to X. So this is, uh, this is I, I, I think, uh, more or less straightforward. So this is the assignment to the instance variable. And now, yeah, basically what you here do, you look up uh, the expression assigned to this in this local variable variable uh, this so this gives you a heap variable h and uh, you assign to h dot x uh, the expression e under the substitution theta so I, I guess this is perhaps all a bit too much to swallow but i hope you get a bit uh, the, the 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 rough uh, idea and i hope that you see that well it's Apart from some technical details, it's not too much of an uh, extension from the basic case. Okay, object creation. Yeah, that's, that's of here you have to deal with dynamically allocated variables. Now, this is, uh, so to speak, here a piece of cake. You just introduce a new, fresh global variable, which you assign to this. Uh, so I assume here that x is a local variable. So this is the case where you assign an instance of class C to the local variable. And how do you model it? But you just generate a new, fresh global variable. This you assign to, to x. And then you update the global heap by assigning the expression nil to any instance variable of uh, y, which is denoted by y dot uh, z. Just introducing symbolically fresh names for uh, uh, dealing with object creation. Nothing more, nothing uh, less. So no actual locations. Uh, many, many tools, there's, there's quite a diver uh, diverse uh, approaches to dealing with uh, object creation in different tools for symbolic execution that that range from using a uh, constraint formula to describe uh, the heap to actually use uh, graphs to represent uh, the heap to introduce logical addresses and you whatever but uh, i think this here th this approach really sticks to the abstraction level of of the of the programming uh, language okay i'm not i'm not going to uh, to uh, pester you with the details of this, uh, the, the method call. I mean, this is really straightforward in, in, in modeling uh, recursion in, in terms of such uh, transition systems. And the same for method return. So let me just uh, skip that. Uh, instead, let me now try to explain a little bit uh, how we can prove correctness of this symbolic execution engine with respect to a concrete transition system. Again, trying as, as smooth as possible to extend uh, the basic uh, case. So 
in the basic case, a valuation was just an assignment of values to variables. Yeah? And you just had a finite set of variables. But now you have, uh, an, in fact, an, an infinite set of variables. Uh, because you have the, the heap variables, and they can be as long as you want. X dot, Y dot, Z dot, 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 dot. Yeah? So they're an infinite number. So you could have protested already. So what the hell? I mean, you're providing here a symbolic execution engine, which is based on a substitution, which is an infinite object. So how do I implement that? I will come to that uh, later. But that's obviously an, uh, an issue uh, here. But I don't bother about that issue for the moment. But uh, I'm defining a valuation. Uh, so what is a concrete valuation? Just as an assignment of values to these heap variables. And values may, apart from integers and booleans, also include object references. And I just need this uh, first clause, which uh, is a constraint on a proper valuation, saying that if uh, uh, two heap variables are assigned the same object in one evaluation, then obviously also v of h dot x, when I dereference h by instance variable x, or I dereference h prime by the instance variable x, they should be also the same, obviously. Huh? So that is a kind of, uh, uh, yeah, that, uh, that evaluation. So here, actually, I respect the semantics of the dot, so to speak. And I have another requirement that is a kind of unique name uh, assumption that for any two global uh, variables, fresh variables, they uh, are assigned unique uh, object IDs. How much time do we have? Yeah, thank you. Okay, then uh, you can define the notion of a heap update uh, for concrete valuations. Yeah, this needs also to take into account uh, of, uh, of aliasing, but this is on the, on the concrete uh, level, so to speak, so it's somewhat uh, easier. Uh, I, uh, let me uh, s skip that. And yeah, then you can define also uh, the assignment to an instance variable. But, but again, uh, it looks all a bit similar, but now we define it in terms of concrete uh, valuations. Let me not go too much into the details here. Uh, but now you can f come up with a, a similar theorem as, as before, the correctness. It's a little bit more complicated because you have to deal with a stack and local environments, etc. But uh, again, I'm not going to pester you with the details, but believe me, this is a, a rather straightforward extension of this basic correctness theorem for this basic programming uh, language. And similarly, you can define uh, uh, a corresponding completeness uh, theorem. So, we, uh, I come to the conclusion. So we have shown how you, how you can come up with a, a general formal theory of symbolic, symbolic execution, where you can really go from a simple language step by step to more complicated ones. And I think this is important to, to understand complex things, not dive directly into the complexity of different concepts, but first focus on the basics and then try to understand, uh, to extend your approach to more complicated uh, stuff. Uh, in the paper, uh, we also d showed how we can extend it to uh, arrays and multi-threading and concurrent objects. Concolic execution is actually also a very simple way to deal uh, with Another uh, interesting thing to explore is the backward uh, execution. Uh, but let me uh, say some uh, uh, few words now on the implementation because, yeah, I mean, the, the very nice and well. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's theory. Uh, I, uh, in the symbolic execution is now, of, of, of object orientation, is based on a substitution which assigns fel, uh, expressions to an infinite number of variables. So how do I implement that? Yeah? I mean, in, uh, in the computer it needs to be finite. So can I find some, some finite basis of this substitution for which it works? Yeah? So but I think this is a nice thing because it now immediately confronts you with clear implementation issues. Yeah? While in many other approaches, yeah, you don't see clearly what is the, the 
yeah, you don't have a clear, very clear focus on what are the implementation issues. And now you see, yeah, a clear implementation issue is to come up with a finite representation of these substitutions. Now, there is one way we can do that that is a bit uh, following, for example, the key approach where you have a sequence of updates. So instead of, of dealing, describing, implementing the symbolic engine in terms of a substitution, you represent the substitution just by the generated updates. That's the rough idea. That's uh, also what the, the, the key theorem prover uh, supports. And then you can come up with, uh, with a finite representation. Uh, now, you can then also focus on other issues, eh, the optimization of aliasing. I mean, you generate all these condi conditional expressions that can uh, give uh, rise to a rather combinatorial explosion, which is one of the ma major uh, obstacles in uh, uh, applying uh, symbolic execution in practice. So you can focus on all kinds of different uh, optimization techniques by, uh, uh, by using some SAT solvers, by evaluating the path condition on the fly, so to speak. Uh, my final uh, words uh, are on some related work. So, to the best of our knowledge, uh, yeah, this is a first formal theory which you could also teach at, at, at students in, in a master course, and where you can start from, from, from some basic uh, language and incrementally extend it to more advanced programming constructs. But there's another uh, work by, uh, by uh, Dorel Lucano and his uh, co-authors who provide a generic framework for symbolic execution. And this is based on uh, matching, matching logic. But it's, in, in my view, a bit too generic because the, the actual symbolic transition system is all, uh, or to say the, the, the language which for which they define symbolic execution, the state transformations are already described in matching matching logic. So uh, matching logic is a kind of relational logic where you can specify uh, logical properties between the input and the output state. So the language is actually already kind of <coughs> symbolic. And then they show that uh, this symbolic transition system corresponds with an actual one, but it does not provide much insight how to deal, for example, with dynamically allocated uh, variables. Okay, thank you for your attention.